Oh, welcome. The dark lights have hit us now. So, all right. I want everyone in the room to kind of raise their hands. I'm an interactive talker. I apologize. I know it's lunchtime and we've hit the post coffee moment. But um, if you're able to, if you're unable to, or just don't feel comfortable doing it, no worries. But if you are an art major, raise your hand. Fantastic. How many of you have had classes in art history? Fantastic. How many of you guys are thinking about practicing art after graduation? And how many of you guys are interested, or y'all are interested in some sort of career within the arts administration museum context? <laughs> I was you one day, back in the day, about 20 years ago. So a little bit about me. My name is Nicole Sukup, as Greg said, and I am from a small town of 2000 in rural Minnesota. I went to school at the University of Minnesota Morris, which was slightly smaller than my hometown, and it was the liberal arts campus. And while there, I knew I wanted to go into something art related, but I didn't know what. I just knew that museums provided a free education. To me, growing up, a kid of two manufacturing folks. My mom was a manager at a factory in Sleepy Eye, and my dad was a manufacturing at 3M and in, in New Ulm. And so I didn't know much what museums looked like. I didn't know I had been in them. I didn't know what arts administration was. I figured I had to do something with budgets and I wasn't great with math. I just knew that I liked making art and I really enjoyed getting my friends together to discuss art and helping them promote their work. At one point, I wanted to be an archeologist and very quickly realized I, am, I like the outdoors, but I am not outdoorsy. <laughs> and I am not tailored to working as an archeologist. You have to be very patient going millimeter by millimeter in some cases um, in a one foot square block and then detailing out those things. I'm not detail orientated in that regard. So I wanna present you guys some feedback and some life advice that I wish I had gotten when I was in your shoes at university. Everybody, now this is the next participatory. You don't have to. But if you're, if you're willing to go with me for a few minutes, I want us to close our eyes and think about the life we want to lead in five years from this day. OK, let's take a deep breath. Your finals are done with. You're out in the field. You're out making your life. This isn't about what you're going to do as a profession. This isn't about your career label. This isn't even about your income. I want you to imagine you're just waking up in your bed. What does your bed look like? What does your home look like? Do you have access to a window with light and nature outside of it? Or do you hear the horns in the streets? Do you have roommates? Are you living with your family? Think about your day to day, starting from that very moment, because there are so many pathways into the arts to be an artist. There is no right or wrong way to be and do what you want to do. It's far more about structuring the life. You need to feel healthy, safe, and secure, the life that you want to feel healthy, safe, and secure. Because at the end of the day, we all exist in late stage capitalism, not to bring in Marxist theory to your art class today, but it's real. We have to pay our bills. You have to be able to afford. Don't know when the last time y'all were at the grocery store, but eggs are now $5 a carton and chicken is soon to be following suit. So what do you need to pay your bills on time and have enough left over to start your retirement account? to start thinking about insurance and savings. And so those types of things, you can open your eyes, I'd recommend that you follow this, this example and spend some time in the next couple of days and write it down. Just, you know, okay, what does my apartment, what does my house look like? 
Do I have a bed? Am I sleeping in a hotel room because I'm traveling? You know, think about just what you want from sunrise to sundown to when you go to sleep. And just one line it. You know, what does your commute look like? Is it by train? Are you in a city? Do you work from home? What are your concerns for the day? Are you working at a laptop? And all those questions will start to filter through and help you give clarity as you start to think about what you and how you structure your next five years. So I had gotten this advice a little too late. I had taken out a credit card and drove my way down to the University of Florida where I got into the PhD program. And very quickly I realized I don't want to be an art historian that just teaches at a college campus. I was spending more time in the art seminars and studying alongside my, my peers in the MFA program, not studying art, but studying art theory. I was spending more time putting up shows like the one you see here. The University of Florida has a space called, uh, at the time it was called the Warp Studio. It was just an abandoned building that the campus had. Um, abandoned is a little, they, it had a working roof at least. Um, but the art faculty had taken it over and that's where the BFAs were encouraged to do part of their seminar work. And we, in conjunction with the Department of English, which had a digital English contingency within it, which means they studied um, you know, books not in book format. It was about books that existed solely on floppy disk or on the internet or digital engagement in that realm. And we, for the Digital Humanities Conference, installed an exhibition thinking about materiality from painting to digital media. And it w by this point, I had been installing art all around the campus, all around Gainesville. To give you an idea, I graduated in 2009, and my final year there is when the Great Recession hit. And I had five job offers standing <coughs> when I graduated with my master's degree thinking I was gonna take a one to two year pause and suddenly they were gone. The companies either folded, the organizations disappeared or suddenly the position disappeared. And the, and the staff that were interviewing me had been laid off. So I was left living in Florida, living paycheck to paycheck off my graduate degree, kind of in a relationship, wondering what the heck I was going to do. Eventually, about a year later, I had got, by that point, I had gotten a job at the university doing administrative work. And I decided to go back home. I was unhappy, not because of Florida, although you, I'll leave you all to create your own Florida guy jokes or Florida person jokes. Um, I was just, I just needed to go home and restore myself. And I applied for a four month internship not knowing that I would be at the Minneapolis Institute of Art 10, 13 years later. And it really happened happenstance. And I want to be very clear, most art careers at the museum level are happenstance. Because most museum careers are not curatorial. They are in registration, they're in conservation, they're in the libraries and archives. And then the other two thirds, <laughs> are often in accounting, facilities, mechanical boiler rooms. They are ensuring, you know, up in the upper Midwest, right, ensuring the snow gets off the roof and is safe. So our grounds crew, our, our largest department is actually our front of house staff. They are the visitor engagement services. And so when you walk into the museum, the people who say hello to you, they'll help you find your way all the way through to at at MIA, we have um, a cafe, and, but museum services can also include your security team. We have a separate security department at MIA. They include a wide range of positions, and they are, the, by and large, the majority. And so thinking about what you want your day-to-day -day life to look like can help structure you as you start to think about what you want your arts life to look like outside of the university, because there is no one way to finding a job. And honestly, there is no one career that works without investing and involving art at the museum level. And I cannot stress this enough. You do not have to have an arts degree to work at a museum. Conversely, if you have an arts degree, it doesn't ex 
preclude you from working at a museum. There's, there's a lot of different ways in what that looks like. And so for me, I knew I wanted to be yeah, driving distance, flying distance within my family. In my 20s and early 30s, I was okay with roommates. I was okay with making less than $45,000 a year. I knew I didn't have family support, but I also didn't have kids. It was just me. I was okay living in a legal back room of an apartment building that my friends had over their contractual <laughs> obligations to have filled. Um, there was like four of us living in a two bedroom house. So I also wanna posit this before I get too far along. These are the list of questions that I wish I had asked when I started my career. And I wanna back up and say, again, you can run an art center and be self-employed and not have a degree in the arts, a BFA at all. What the BFA offers you is the opportunity to be more mobile in the economy wherever you reside. Having the MFA provides additional education on top of that. It allows you to teach at a university level. All of these degrees add access, but they come at a cost. And so when you are thinking about working in either the museum or arts sector, I wish someone had told me to investigate the company. We are often told and taught that nonprofit is different than corporate culture, and it really isn't. All a nonprofit is is a tax designation from the IRS. I hate to burst anyone's bubble. You would hope that the ethos follows suit. Sometimes it doesn't. So does the company's mission statement align with my personal values? Some of the, the, some of the most unknown for-profit jobs in the arts are actually ghostwriters. They're the people who help artists write grants, help administrate your, uh, um, your studio. They also do freelance work as um, contractual fundraisers, so an organization needs fundraising. These companies may or may not have a mission statement, and they may or may wor not work with organizations that you're comfortable with or not comfortable with. So just do the work on the back end and ask what is, you know, the rep the bigger thing, I think, is what is their staff reputation? Are they a family first environment? So when I was working at Mia, my dad was diagnosed with leukemia, and at the time I was a curatorial assistant. My parents had divorced, and so it really fell on myself and my siblings to take care of him. I don't know if anyone knows what leukemia is like. It's not pretty, and my dad had a very aggressive form of it. So he was unable to leave the University of Minnesota's healthcare facility, not even leave his room. He had no immune system. And so somebody had to be on site, on call 24 seven until after his bone marrow transplant. And so thankfully, I worked at a company that handed me a laptop, a laptop and said, we'll figure out the rest. We'll get you on FMLA. You have so many days within the state of Minnesota and federal law. FMLA is the Family Medical Leave Act. It is an unpaid guarantee that you can come back after your medical leave. It's a set number of hours that usually equates to about three to four months of continuous leave to come back to your company at equal pay or similar position. It doesn't guarantee your position, but often it will. And it allows you um, there's two forms, so there's continuous and intermittent. And I was able to go on intermittent work on site and off site. And that was, it, and it still is one of the reasons why I still am at MIA. Um, you know, and what is its engagement with visitors? What are visitors' reputation? Don't be afraid to look at the Yelp reviews before you interview. Um, and, and know that everyone has their own opinion of every place. Uh, is the position hourly or salaried? So I'm in the rare position of being an hourly curator. My hours are capped at 37.5 hours a week, which is full time in the state of Minnesota. And if I wanna work above and beyond that, I need to get approval for overtime. What that does is it means I'm out the door at five o'clock and I can go home to my son. If I was salaried as a curator, I would be working 50 to 60 hours a week every week. So would I still have time for my kids? Of course. But would I then be working in another two to three hours after I put them to bed? Of course. 
Of course. So think about, I, these are really pragmatic questions that I wish I had been told. And then the other thing is, especially as you start out your career, whether it's in the arts or elsewhere, it's really vital to ask up front, do you provide relocation assistance? Oftentimes, a company may or may not inform you up front if they do. In the museum field, unfortunately, for fellows, it's very rare to find relocation assistance. Internships, by the way, by law, need to be paid. If you're unpaid, it should be for college credit only, or your college can provide the stipend. So what that has done and what that means is the internship is no longer the driving force in, on the curatorial side of things. It's research, your publications. So just bear that in mind as you start to think through and emerge your career. What is available? What is the stipend? What is, can I live off this? How many jobs am I going to need to help support my career? Secondly, no one tells you to, or I, I, I know your faculty probably have, but my faculty did not tell me to investigate the cost of living for the city. It was assumed we would know that New York was expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. But Minneapolis, for a two-bedroom apartment now, is $2,000 on average a month. The pandemic has done a radical thing in that it's shifted the landscape. So if you're moving and you're expected to pay first and last month's down deposit, is it viable for you to go there? The other thing I'll say, working in the Midwest, you'll get much more hands-on experience as an emerging curator and probably be paid better comparative to the cost of living than you would anywhere else in the, in the country. Um, you know, and then, you know, will my partner be able to find a job or will I support the household? You know, money. And then does the city, county, state offer grants or subsidies for lower to middle income families? And I think oftentimes in the nonprofit sector, we're encouraged to not think about that, to, to survive that it's a sign of strength or a class stereotype to inquire, but my family relies on a state benefit for having assistance for my son. My son is autistic. And so we get free therapy through this, um, the city of Minneapolis school, public school system. And that's sponsored through the state of Minnesota, so that includes free busing. Um, but it does require that I drop him off every morning. And then, you know, we also get assistance for daycare. The average cost in daycare, Minnesota being the highest in the country, is $1,400 a month on average. So as you're thinking through you know, your place, now the other side of this is many artists are self-employed. In the state of Minnesota, there are more individual artists compared to artist collectives than anywhere else in the country, and that is because of the nature of the arts field. In the state of Minnesota, the st statistic is slightly outdated, but it's not far off. In the state of Minnesota, Artists are, have available to them $11 per person of state grants and access. To give you some idea, the next, one of the next highest states is the state of New York, and that's $1.75 per person. Now, there are more people in New York than the $6 million in Minnesota, so there's some difference. But you have more access if you live in Moorhead than you live in Fargo. The flip side of this is that it's far more competitive than ever before because artists are coming back to Minnesota because it's more affordable. So thinking about um, you know, those kinds of relationships to grants and funders, the corporate side, all of it, you know, and you're independent as an artist, um, even as a museum, we inquire our social practice artists, sculptors to have liability insurance if they're bringing in studio assistance. And uh, have a Take a free online course on contracts and behavior. Um, many small business associations offer them. I work with a lot of artists that don't understand that they are liable for the taxes that come out of their honoraria the, um, and the fee structures. We have really great resources in Minnesota like, that I believe are open to anyone in the Midwest. And so I, I just encourage you to do some investigation as you start to establish your artistic practice and then, if I can, the curatorial side of me. Archive images alongside your CV. Build your budgets, even if you're not going to require it, if it's out of pocket or 
the opportunity doesn't require it, track how much it costs, how long it costs to, for you to create your project, and then follow up and close out. So ask for those installation shots. If you're working with a large scale institution, we provide free images. I wish I had known all of this when I was an independent curator, and I really wished that because I was installing in abandoned buildings, doing it myself, I got cut, didn't have health insurance, and I relied on free access to clinics as I was doing it. My friends were just winging it because a wall is a wall is a wall. However, let me tell you, a hospital bill is a hospital bill is a hospital bill. So I quickly realized that for me, I wanted to focus on the research, focus on the curatorial side and work with artists far more than I wanted to do the business side. And so I, like I said, fell into the Minneapolis Institute of Art by way of an unpaid internship 10 years ago. We no longer offer unpaid internships. In 2017, Mia welcomed over 990,000 visitors, making us one of the largest institutions in the country. We are the largest museum that might be slightly out of date. Our collections are just under 100,000. And we span over 5,000 years of history. Founded in 1915 as part of the Minneapolis Society of Fine Arts, um, we were intended to be the arts and culture hub and then a predominant founding member of the city council at the time in the 1990s died without a will and 16 kids and we lost our collection. He was a pretty predominant and preeminent collector of French Impressionism and the family needed the resources so they sold the collection pretty quickly. We still have a few works and we've been able to acquire a few others through auction over the years, but that very quickly meant that our building, which was supposed to be two city blocks by two city blocks, became this core building that you know now as the McKinley Mead and White facade. And so with that core collection, and as I was talking about, our vision is to inspire wonder through the power of art. Mia stopped collecting contemporary art around 1960, 1960, and I came to the museum at a point where they had just restarted collecting contemporary art. The museum wasn't really quite equipped on how to work with artists, but I had been doing it now for five years independently and through internships and different backgrounds. So I had the skills and the resources that I could offer the institution, and that's been a lot of my career at Mia has been doing the backside, the back work, and building the relationships and connecting the community of artists to the institution. And so I've done a lot of things over the years. I've done a lot of exhibitions from working with Sky Hapinka. We acquired this piece called Cloudless Blue Egress, which is a, a film. Um, and then I started, though, working as an exhibition research assistant on a show called More Real Art in the Age of Truthiness, based on uh, the premise of Col uh, Stephen Colbert's uh, Comedy Central show and his, his, his phrase truthiness and so it was about pro proxy and parody in contemporary art in the digital age and so this piece up front that I know a couple of you have noticed is a Maurizio Padalon piece. What Mia offered was an ability to work with international artists and I've been doing that since my very start at the museum. Over the time, I've been able, while well, as a curatorial assistant, now let me stop. Do you guys know the difference between curatorial assistant, assistant curator, associate curator? No, I don't. I didn't know either. My mom still doesn't understand it. She says I go to the business. So let me take a moment and say a curatorial assistant is typically the bottom tier of the curatorial rung at a museum, in particular a large scale museum like Mia. You are doing research, but you're also doing administrative tasks alongside it. Sometimes, if you're the size of the Met, you also have an office manager, but oftentimes your curatorial assistant is your office manager. So they're filing the paperwork, and in many cases, this is still legitimately paperwork, to get the work out of storage, get it to the con conservators, if there's conservators on site, to the archivists and registrars to ensure that they are tracking where the works are going, and then get the work on place, on the right spot, and the pedestal and anything else that needs to happen happens and so they're the vital link to make sure that anything happens then you have an assistant curator which is what i am and an assistant curator to associate curator is kind of fuzzy but typically you have a couple of publications under your belt 
and then you go up to the rank to associate. It's much like professors, right? You have your tenured, your non-tenured, your adjunct. I'm not quite at an adjunct day because I do have a guarantee that I'll be at Mia, hopefully, knock on wood, in three months. But I, I am still not an associate professor or curator. I don't have the same experience. A full curator at me until very recently was a department head. They were simultaneous together. They were, they were the same thing. But now full curators exist without that title, but they just have more experience in different ways and aspects. A curator at a large scale museum. So when I was an assistant curator, I helped coordinate the, the cross institutional event called the Gorilla Girls take over the Twin Cities or the Gorilla Girls take over. It involved 80 different institutions and I was on, I represented the Minneapolis Institute of Art. My counterpart on the project was Olga Viso, the former director of the Walker. And then Carrie Morgan represented the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and a few other freelance curators ebbed and flowed throughout the project as it rolled through. It resulted in a PowerPoint that really looked at took an honest look at our statistics and asked why we didn't say unknown artist. It's just simply said maybe the nationality or, or maker, like unknown maker is another alternative to unknown artist. Because in saying the nationality, it denies the fact that a person created this. And where this came to a real like eye-opening moment for the museum was when it came to our Native American collections. Most of our collections on view are done so with the guidance of different councils. And so we bring in councils of artists that we pay to help advise and shape the exhibitions and displays that we do. But prior to 2015, we, we weren't really thinking about the public's interpretation of that. And what we were missing in that gap was that many of the makers were women. That Traditionally and contemporary, many of the ways in, of knowing and the many of the ways of knowledge were held by women. And that led to the exhibition, Hearts of Our People, a full survey, not full survey, that makes it sound conclusive, a survey of women, Native women in America, Native, excuse me, I'm going to not quite get the subtitle now. I needed another cup of coffee. But, but Native women and their role in as makers over about 250 years span up to the present the majority were contemporary artists so in addition to that my job and my purview is how do we flip the script then how do we get artists and visitors rethinking and re-engaging with collections and so i stepped in when a colleague took a job at the tate to oversee the exhibition with Sarah Vanderbeek in our photography galleries. Sarah came in and she documented works from our collection. All of these works were made for the market at their time, the majority of which were made post-1900. But because they took, and they took on and were part of traditional aesthetics, many people had presumed that they were much more historic in nature than they actually were. And in fact, in front of you here, you have this really beautiful braided um, belt from Morocco that was created in the early 20th century. You have a pot that was created around 1910 from the Southwest. And you have these neoclassical sculptures that were again created for market. And this book by an artist whose name is also escaping me at the moment. But all of which, we included all of the provenance information on in the in the labels and we rearranged it on a low pestle so you could actually see 360 almost around these 3d objects mm -hmm. that took inspiration for the the 2d works on the back which sarah's father was an experimental filmmaker and that really influenced her way of rethinking the flat image and in the multiplicity of images on a single screen like we do with laptops every day right i'm notorious i have 15, 16 tabs open at any given time. And we just automatically flip or doom scroll at night like I might do as well. So these kind of things got our visitors rethinking. Now, hand in hand with this, I should also mention 
that the Minneapolis Institute of Art has four major exhibit areas. Our largest one is 12,000 square feet. Our smallest is 1,000 square feet. We have one dedicated space for the Minnesota Artist Exhibition Program, a 50-year program where a panel of elected artists who live and work in the state of Minnesota select one proposal to be on view. Artists who are selected have an honorarium of $8,000 and currently are reimbursed up to $5,500. We're looking to make that a stipend so you guys don't need to be reimbursed, that it's just upfront cash for the artists to work on the project as they see fit. We also don't prohibit artists from getting in-kind sponsorship for their work, seeking other funds, et cetera. The MAP is a really great way to think how museums approach because it's so antithetical to how museums typically approach an exhibition. As a curator, I'm tasked with presenting two to three exhibitions every year. What that is is up to me, but I need approval from my supervisor, or at least I need to let them know what I'm working on. And then it goes up to our, you know, our, our deputy director, chief curator, and our head of exhibition strategy and planning, and our director. And they take that information, they look at the scholarship, they look at the re resonance within the field, they ask, okay, will this be up against six other shows that would be traveling around the same time? Is it different? What is the draw? One of the things they look at are net promoter score. So how likely are you as a visitor to tell another person about the show and by word of mouth spread in addition to the paid advertisement? And we gather all of this data. Now, MIA is a large institution where we have statisticians in-house to gather feedback, to think about how we present works of art, and to think about how we can continue to both push boundaries and really rethink traditional exhibition displays. So the MAP is great because there's none of that. It's just a 500 word exhibition pitch, 500 word artist statement, and 10 images that you submit. And your peers, who you may or may not know, will select one. And now we do three open calls per year that align with an exhibition in this 2,000 square foot space. It is a funky space. It is underneath the brand stairwell. And at one point was where our creators and our registrars, or excuse me, our preparators would work. So there's a, literally a rolling door buried in the wall. They just walled over it. <laughs> and didn't take it down and and the floors are a little askew so it's a funky little space that kind of works in our favor because we can get a little funky with it too and so as coordinator i oversee the panel of seven i arrange the meeting times but once an artist is selected i really work with the artist hand in hand to see through their exhibition um, Pre-pandemic, we had about 20,000 visitors coming to our shows on average. That doesn't mean $20,000 all at once. Some days there were zero in the galleries and some days there were 2,000. It really tracked with our audience ebb and flow. Our highest attended period at the museum is actually the holidays and then the spring because Mia does this exhibition program that many museums have long ago not followed suit with called Art in Bloom, where we bring in floral designers to interpret or reinterpret works of art through flower, flower displays. And people love it. We had, at one point pre-pandemic, 10,000 visitors in three days. Yeah, and uh, many of the staff don't work on that Friday <laughs> because we can't find parking. <laughs> and so, or you're, or you're walking in blocks away. It is a very popular event and it's a big fundraiser for us. That event allows us to provide free busing for our students. I should also mention that MIA is free and open to the public with the exception of our 12,000 square foot exhibition space. And so thinking through that, and I kind of went through this a little bit, but the MAP is open to emerging to mid-career artists, and that's defined differently than I think. And one thing, again, coming back to this, there is no single definition for anything. Um, 
A mid-career artist is simply somebody who doesn't have international presentation or representation at a gallery in, in Minnesota. So that's pretty much everyone who's completed school and is eligible to work and present and apply to this program. We accept less than 1% of all applicants. That doesn't mean that we have a whole bunch of applicants. It means we've been around for 50 years, and some years we've had 75 people apply, and some years we get 20. So less than 1% have shown with the museum. The other thing, though, is because Minnesota is in our title, it doesn't mean we show Minnesota art. There is no such thing as Minnesota art. There is no such thing as Midwestern art. You might incorporate those themes or stereotypes into your artwork. You might work with traditional values or concepts as an artist, but it's contemporary. You're, you're a living artist, you're making art, and that's what we show. And so this is Nicole Havacost. She's from Rochester, Minnesota. Most of her work actually was shown in the southeast, eastern part of the United States prior to showing, despite living in Minnesota for 20 years. She makes monumental textile sculptures, as you can see in the back room there, and these weird amorphous holes, if you guys have that fear of holes, maybe not look her up. So she creates textiles that look like skin and uses dress patterns and dyes them and then hand stitches them together to create these very um, feminist, very uh, tactile experiences but it's all through sewing and pattern and, and standard materials. To the right, we have Monica Sheets, who's currently on view, and that is her neon piece called Collective Autonomy. Um, Monica got her MFA actually at the Weimar University in, in Germany and was born and raised in Cincinnati. And what she realized living and working in Eastern Germany is that it was a lot like the Rust Belt in the United States. After the fall of communism in Germany and the reunification of the country, the economy just collapsed. And so her work is a 15-year archive that brings these conversations into dialogue with one another. We've also installed Living LG by way of Allison Hiltner, where you would blow into the piece and the LG would talk back to you, kind of in close encounters of the third kind, light pattern, kind of. And then uh, Jonathan Herrera Soto, who just is about to get his MFA from Yale, uh, prior to going to Yale, he graduated from MCAD and just rigorously applied to the program. And about two years after applying, he got this opportunity. The faces that you see on the floor are the murdered and missing journalists. More journalists are killed through state-sponsored violence in Mexico than any other country to date. And that includes Ukraine, that includes Russia, that includes Afghanistan, Pakistan more journalists are killed in Mexico. So these are 200 faces that he screen printed using Adobe mud on the floor of the museum. And as visitors walked across, their faces were erased. Yeah. And on the back, he made calligraphs out of clothing that were representative of the, oftentimes, just the bits and pieces that people are found along the, the frontera of people who were just disposed of, who were made to disappear, or were coming into the United States looking for a better opportunity and got lost in the wilderness or didn't quite make it across the Rio Grande. Jonathan is a dual citizen of Mexico and the United States, and his sister happens to be a body examiner for the city of Mexico. And so as a young child, he had a deep connection to this recovery of people. Um, Jonathan grew up in Chicago and came to study in Minnesota. So all of our artists represent the full span of people coming to the state temporarily, maybe because of education and opportunity, or they relocated because their partner got a job at Mayo Clinic. Um, they don't necessarily have shown in Minnesota before or have sh may been making art very long. Nicole Havacost is in her 50s now, I believe. So, and she didn't, that was her first museum show. So. With that, I'm just going to end this and kind of give space with the time that we have left for questions. Can we get the light? Sorry, I hit dark and I got the lights on. Didn't think that through. So I kind of launched a lot at everyone, and I gave you guys a lot of questions and tidbits and stuff, but 
I also left a lot of room because I want to, and we have 15 minutes now, I want to hear from you guys. What can I give back to you, understanding that it's, it's just me and my, my opinion? But any questions? Yeah. I am a failed artist. <laughs> I, the best crit criticism I ever got in art school, I was, so I graduated with a BA in art history, a minor in studio art, Spanish, anthropology, and a language certificate in Italian. And that sounds like a lot, but like I said, I went to school in a city of 2000, and there wasn't much to do this time of year. So we all were multi-majors. The best critique I ever got was, you make really great commercial photography. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no job in stock photography. So, no, I'm, I'm not. I, I can paint my walls really well. That's about it. <laughs> I, but I will also, I'm, all jokes aside, I very early realized that I needed to make a choice. Um, the, um, uh, there are different alliances and business associations aligned with museums, and one of them is the Association for Art Museum Curators. And as such, I signed an agreement, an ethical code, that I can't provide um, or I can't provide artists or, or tip my hand on the scale for price of artwork. And I also couldn't create situations where my artwork would be in direct competition or conflict of interest with artists. So very early on, I, had, I made the decision that I wanted to work in a museum with the understanding that my, pra my artistic practice was a conflict of interest. And also, there's only so many hours in the day and I like watching trashy TV <laughs> instead of being in the studio late at night. So it was an easy choice for me. Yeah. Are there ever opportunities for somebody, say from, I don't know, North Dakota, to come and like shadow you for a day or just kind of get a glimpse into the world of what it's like? for you to be doing you. Absolutely, and so Mia offers a number of different um, opportunities. Shadowing is a really great opportunity. It's, a, it's typically a one day or a couple hour event where you come and you shadow or you get time with museum professionals. Most museums offer that, I believe. It's one-on-one -on -one and dependent on the curators. You are free to email me. I will say I'm very busy through July because I'm working on a on a major exhibition with an artist named Jim Denemy, who is Ojibwe and unfortunately passed away in March of last year. And so I was working with him and now I'm working with the estate on a catalog and 6,000 square foot solo survey. But ask me after July and I'd be happy to make time for you. And, but I'm just one, right? In Minneapolis and St. Paul alone, there are four major art museums. There's the Walker, there's me up, there's also the Wiseman affiliated with the University of Minnesota. And there's also the M, the Minnesota Museum of American Art. Between here and, and Minneapolis, you have the Plains, Fargo, and Andy Moss and his team are really fantastic and also offer those opportunities. And I'll also say, at a smaller institution, you'll get a deeper breadth of what museum professionals do. So you'll, you'll get a little bit of all of it because we have to do a little bit of all of it to make it happen and flow. But we don't offer internships at this time. We do offer some fellowships, and they're posted on our jobs and employment page, so please do keep an eye open. I'm guessing more will be posted within the next year, but yeah, always shadowing is a great option. Yeah. Um, do you know like, the advertising that the museums for exhibitions mm -hmm. and stuff? Yep. Um, have they tried like, different Advertisement plans, what, what seems to be the uh, most effective? Social media. So, um, and online digital advertisement. So, there's different packages. We have in house designers, graphic designers, and we have different uh, teams that help design and lay out. And we have all of that's kind of built into our major packages. And then we have smaller exhibitions. We have a, what's called a brand. Mia sold ours, we have a, what's something called a brand content plan, and so we have a hero that's often our ticketed 12,000 square foot show, and that takes the lead for the exhibition, and then that usually will get print, billboard, bus, a, a traditional media presentation, but for MAP, 
It's our net promoter score. It's word of mouth that drives most of our attendance. Yeah, and, and artists promoting it on their own channels, actually. It's higher revenue than our own. So with, with something like the MAE, mm -hmm. uh, is that something that's funded by MIA, or is there sponsorship or corporate funding that goes into like sustaining that program? What a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. So at MIA, there's also a fundraising plan. Again, there's a lead need. MAP falls under suit. For a long time, we had grant fellowships through different fundraisers. We amicably parted with our longtime supporter, the McKnight Foundation, who gave us a very generous package for the last few years. Now it is almost fully funded, but it's almost always been fully funded by the, the museum. The museum has always paid for my salary. It pays for our designers, our preparators, crew salaries. And, and so it's always been, you know, we pay for the electricity in the building. Even though we're on LEDs, it's a couple of grand a month, I'm sure. So it, you know, those kinds of, operations are housed within the museum. But we, we had had foundation assistance in the past. We're, we're, we're still looking and open for those opportunities. But right now, we're primarily funded through the very generous support of RBC, a, a bank, and other private individuals um, that, uh, to get on the backside of donor relationships. When you donate to a museum, no matter the cost, you can say, I want this to go to this program specifically. Or you can donate, like, no strings attached. And usually that kind of donation will go to our operations or to other needs. Um, when you specify, by law, that has to go to that program. And so that's caused actually a lot of issues within the museum and nonprofit industries in the past where things were earmarked for only 19th century Western paintings that were painted in Ohio or further west along this, like, you know, they can get quite granular and specific because of the nature of the donor. More often than not, you, when you're working with advancement, they'll say, we've got an endowment, it can be for anybody in finance, so we can be a little bit more flexible with our stuff. But for the MAP, yeah, we have specific funding from corporate sponsors, and then, um, we encourage artists to also seek funding as they need because an exhibition can cost two thousand and it can cost thirty thousand. I have a quick follow up. Can yeah. You know, is the MAP is that like for their matching funds? Are they able to seek like is it can it be matched with like state grants? Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. I'm actually one of the reasons why I was late to the late to see Greg this morning is because I had to convey to our 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 label and design and editors and our grad, like the, the folks who make all the labels and stuff, our, our graphic designer and editor that, uh, the artist just notified me they got a Minnesota State Arts Board grant. And with that grant, you have to have their logo and a very specific phrase in the gallery while the show's on view, because it's paid by taxpayers, because <laughs> it comes from the state of Minnesota. And uh, I had to rush that into production line. So yeah, absolutely, we encourage it we recognize that artists need more than what we can provide. Well, we're kind of the end of the, our, our time for today, but um, uh, so Nicole is going to go to lunch with Bill over in the cafeteria. And if there's anybody that does not have to immediately go to another class, you're welcome to go along and visit and you hang out. Studies. And then... Museum you can studies. go, or we will meet with the NAC at two. So feel free to join Bill and Nicole for lunch. Yep, and then uh, Nicole will also be at our museum studies. Yeah. If there are any other questions, too, feel free to email. I know asking in front of people isn't comfortable. Uh -huh. I got the signage. Oh, yeah. Or if you even just want my solution here, I'll hold it. Yeah, I'm fine with whatever's easiest, but I'm American. Yeah, yeah, yeah.